Most of you know, but some of you don't. We've been on a series, an AHA series. Five, this is week five of a six-part series. And it's pretty powerful. We've been studying the, the parable of the prodigal son in, in Luke chapter 15. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 15 to see where we're at in the parable itself about the prodigal son. You know, when we saw the prodigal son last week, we, uh, we saw that he was feeding pigs. He was in the pig pen. And uh, he was wanting to eat the slop. It was so bad. He'd reached an all-time low in his life. He was so hungry that he even says in the Word of God that he wanted the pods, the slop that the pigs were eating. But he, he had to be brutally honest about his situation and realize that until he admitted why he was there, where he was at, what brought him to that spot, he couldn't leave. He had to be brutally honest. So far in the story, we've got two of the three ingredients to this recipe. The sudden awakening. The brutal honesty with himself. Those around him and God. But the third ingredient is sudden, is the immediate action, which I've discovered is the actual hardest one of the three. Last week I believed that Brutal honesty was the hardest of the three. I'm learning as I'm doing a series myself. And God has given me real world examples that I can share to see that it really is the action that's the hardest part. If you turn your Bibles to Luke 15 and starting with 17, and uh, the next slide, and it says, At last he came to his senses and said, All my father's hired workers have more than they, eat, they can eat, and here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. The next slide. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity and he ran, threw his arms around his son and he kissed him. We only went to the first line of verse 20 last week. He had his sudden awakening. He came to his senses and we discussed that. He had to be brutally honest with himself about the consequences that he deserved. Not only was he in it, that he deserved it. It was his own fault. Now he wants to truly have this aha moment in his life. So what's he have to do? He has to act. There has to be action. He has to do something. You know, unless you act, you won't have aha. Unless you act, it really is just an emotional roller coaster. And so many of us live an emotional roller coaster. You really need to hear this today. There is something in your life, and your emotional roller coaster is because you haven't acted on it. Joshua wanted water, but he had to dig the well, folks. It's kind of like this. I mean, how many of y'all ever done Groupon or know what Groupon is? Group you? I've kind of figured you would. <laughs> here's pretty frugal lady. Uh, but here's how it works. Groupon pretty much works this way. You sign up and then you get an email every day with a new deal. It's like the deal of the day. It's perfect, okay? You, you have to buy the coupon from this website that they send you the coupon. And you save a lot of money doing so if you use the coupon, of course. Amen? Every once in a while, there's something that's really worth your time. Something that you're really interested. You really want the deal. You can save a ton of money. On stuff like restaurants that you like to go to, uh, vacations, uh, jewelry that you like, um, Harley Davidson accessories. <laughs> but the thing, the thing is that when you get this email, if you see some great deal and you really get excited about it and you really want to buy it and you just really, really got to have it and you, you got to buy it then, you got to buy the coupon then, right then. You don't have a choice. The next day the deal's over. The next day the deal is over. You can't just see it. You can't just want it. You can't just realize it's a great deal and then close the email and hope that some magical way you'll receive this great deal. You have to take action. You have to take action. If you don't act, you won't have aha. I think this is the hardest of the three ingredients, which I've already said, and I've learned this myself. Um, it's hard to be brutally honest with yourself, and I said that was the hardest one. 
hard to be brutally honest with God and your friends, but it's not. And I had live examples, um, live examples this week. It's it's like when you look down and I said I shared this with somebody. I think it was my wife, but it's like after a, a binge of eating improperly for the holiday season, you look down like this in the bathroom and you go, "Oh my God, I've got to do something." We've well, already seen it. You've had the aha awakening. You've already been brutally honest, but you step off and you wait till New Year's Day to make a resolution. You ain't going to keep anyway. You see, the act is the hardest part. I've I've been face to face with individuals that are taking medication for. Uh, different things, diabetes, eating improper food. I was with a pastor one time that couldn't understand because of his pain and the things he was going through. And out of his mouth, while he was talking about not understanding, the pastor picked up a, a, a big piece of cake and ate it. Almost in one bite. Oh. But that's... He, he was honest with himself of knowing he had a problem. It's like an individual that meets me once in a while telling me, I know I've got to work out. I know I've got to lose weight. I know I need to burn off calories and eat less. But then is also brutally honest, it's too cold outside. <laughs> brutally honest. you got to get from point A to point B, sister. And bru <coughs> brutally honest. Now, last week I thought that was the hardest part, but take action really is the hardest part. It's the hardest part. Take an action. See, it's the hardest part to get up. To get up. You know, the word got up in 1520 is that he's actually, is also the same Greek word that was used for resurrection. Now, our Lord didn't do that on accident. It's raising you up from the dead into a new life. Raising you up from doing the things not of God to doing the things of God. Amen? Woo! New life. It literally means to get up, but I wonder if Jesus really meant to tell us you need to be resurrected from your old life into the new life. Amen? The same word. Getting up can be the difference between divorce and mending your marriage. Getting up can be the difference between struggling with an ongoing addiction and your freedom. Getting up is the difference between giving in to your peer pressure that's around you and staying from that stuff that you swore you wouldn't do anyway. Getting up is the difference between continuing to feel alone and forgiving that grudge that you have held for so long with someone. So my question today is, what does it take to get up? What does it take to get up? Because unless you act, you don't take action, you won't have the aha moment that God wants you to have. The aha turnaround in your life. I think in order to get up, there's three things you need to know. The first one is, where are you? Where you are. Do you know where you are? We talked about being brutally honest where you are. Just like the son had to be brutally honest about his situation last week. He had to understand that staying there is unacceptable. Aha takes an understanding of what life can be too. Aha takes an understanding of the power of God and how He can get you out of that mess. Because if you don't know, or if you don't believe, if you don't know or believe that God can truly have something better for you than where you're currently at, you're not going to get up. You're going to stay where you're at. This is not the best analogy, but it it kind of shows you that Sometimes you don't have to know exactly how you're going to get somewhere. All of us, well, most of us, there's, a, there's some young ones in here, but all the adults that are being spoken to by the Holy Spirit right now, you've all been seniors. And as a senior in high school, you would do just about anything to get out of the house. You would just about do anything to get out of high school and get into college or wherever you were going next. And that's because you knew in here and here that no matter how, how good it's been, no matter the fact that you've been taken care of, no matter that, that your mom's done your laundry, no matter that things have been pro provided for for the last 18 years, home-cooked meals, you know it's time to leave. Now, you know it's time to leave. 
You can't always say why, and you can't always say where you're going or how you're going to get there, but you know the general direction that you're going to go, and you know it's time to leave. There's just something in us that tells us, I can't stay here anymore. I've got to move on. And that's what it takes to get up. That's what it takes for us to get up. We have to go beyond the honesty that we talked about last week. Here I am starving to death, Lord. He said that, right? And you got to realize you don't have to starve to death anymore. When you know where you are, and when you know you don't have to stay there anymore, it makes it possible to get up and take action. Number two, where are you going? I kind of hit on it a little bit. The second thing you have to know is where you're going. Now, here's what I'm not saying right now. I hit on it, but make sure you understand. I'm not saying that you have to have all the answers. Sometimes that stops us from getting up because we just think we don't know from point A to point B to point C how we're going to get to that final destination. Don't have to know all that. You just got to know that the final destination is better than where you're at right now. What I'm saying is when you know which direction you're going and which direction you need to go, it's a, it just makes things a whole lot easier. If you know which direction you're going, it just makes things a whole lot easier. When the prodigal son got up, he knew where he was going. Now, he said, back to my father's house. Back to my father's house. Now, I doubt if he knew exactly how long it was going to take him to get back to his father's house. Remember, he left with all the money and riches. He, he could take care of everything. He probably didn't even know. I doubt if he even knew how he was going to get his food, how he was going to get water, how he was going to take care of shelter. He may not even be sure of the route anymore. But he knew where he was going. you catching this, right? Where are you going? He didn't know how the place might have changed that he left from. He didn't know how his older brother, whether he would even talk to him. He didn't know what kind of reception he would get from his father because of what he'd done to his family. But he knew this. He knew it would be better circumstances than where he was at right now. So he got up. He got up. When you have an aha moment, rarely, if ever, is God going to tell you exactly how you're going to get from here to there. <laughs> and we so many times try to help him. <laughs> but if you know where you're going, and if you know that God's waiting for you, just get up. Amen. If you know where you're going, if you know what God has in store for you, that's better than where you're at. Amen. It might not be easy. In fact, it's probably going to be very hard in most cases. That's why we die at that third ingredient, the immediate action. Because it takes our, our devotion and courage to stand up, to get up. But when God gives you an aha moment, He just wants you to come home. It, mean, it might mean saying, I don't know if I'll fit right in church, but I know I need to go. It might mean saying, I might lose all my friends if I quit partying. But I know I need to quit. And I don't want to live that life anymore. It might mean saying, I don't know if she'll ever, ever forgive me. But I know that the Word of God says I have to be honest. Whew, somebody need to hear that. This morning. It might mean saying, forgive, for, forgiving my Blank, mom, dad, husband, wife, children, friend, blank, whatever. God's given you one to put in there. Forgiving my blank might be the hardest thing I've ever done, but I know that I need to forgive others the way Jesus forgave me. <laughs> That's real powerful. Everybody needed to hear that one. When you see, when you can see the present into the future, when you can see past the present into the future, Woo. And what God has for you, woo, it takes immediate action. It makes immediate action possible, and you can get up. When you know where you're going, 
You know what the end goal is. It just makes it possible. The third thing is, and this is the best part. You know where you are. You know where you can be going. Who's waiting for you? Woo! This is exciting. Now. <laughs> who's waiting for you? You've got to know who's waiting for you. And if you go to the next slide, we're going to pick up with 20 again. <laughs> and it says, next slide. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity, and he ran, threw his arms around his son and kissed him. Father, the son said, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Next slide. But the father called to his servants, Hurry, he said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it and let us celebrate Woo! On woo, with a feast. Amen? For this son of mine was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the feasting began. Hallelujah. We know who's waiting on us. Amen. The son would obviously known his father. We know our father, right? The son knows his father. But there's no way that he could have ever expected this type of reception from his father, his earthly father. Oh, we know our God's even better than that. Amen. Where is his father's anger? We don't see it. Where is his son's punishment? His punishment. Where is the son's punishment? There is none. The only thing that we see is a celebration. Even before the son got all the way there, the father was running out to greet him. You have to understand what this means, especially in that, in that time. Even today, the way they think in the Middle East, he's wearing a robe, and he picks the robe up between his legs, and he's running. So he's bare legs, and he's running. He's, he's became... That's indignation of him. He's, he, he has belittled himself to the lowest slave in his household. Running after his son. Even before the son could get there, he was watching for his son and seeing him from far off. And he pulls up his gown his ga and he takes off running with the bare legs. Can you just vision that? Can you just see this guy doing that? And all his people that work for him, and and his his oldest son, and his and and they're and they're everybody that's working for him is going. Oh, th this is wrong. This is wrong. Everybody's look. You talk about gossip going around fast. Look at that guy. He's oh, we work for that guy. Whew. But he shows. He you know what he does? He takes those social customs and he throws them out the door. He takes the taboos and he throws them out the window. He don't care. He runs to hug his son. You know, when Jesus was telling this story, he was telling this story, and when he was telling the story, nobody expected this. Don't you love it when you're listening to a story and all of a sudden the, the, the end just like blows you away, your socks pop off your feet, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Doesn't that get you? I mean, they did not expect this. Not out of this. This, this father that has all this real estate and all these people, they're like, whoa, did I hear that right? Rewind. Jesus just said, and that's exactly why Jesus told the story that way. So we could keep sharing it the rest of eternity with one another, or at least while we're here. See, now we can predict how our Father will be waiting for us. Jesus tells about our Father who waits patiently eagerly for us to return. And some of us need to return to the Father's house. Jesus tells about a Father who would do anything to see us back in His house. Jesus tells us about a Father who would suffer unimaginably while He waits for His children to come home by letting His only begotten Son die on the cross for those that He loves. And now, we know who is waiting on us. Aha begins with us. Aha begins with us, but it ends with God. Aha ends with God. When we take our life, and when we take our money, and we go off to a distant country, God lets us go. He lets us make the decision to leave. He lets us make the decision to abandon our families. 
He lets us make the decision to treat people unfairly. He lets us make the decision to throw our lives away in sin. God lets us make the decision to pursue our own selfish desires in this life. To try to fill up the emptiness that we have in our lives with drugs, with pornography, with anger, with work, with sports, with TV, with video games, with blank. If I didn't say it, you got it right now. God just gave it to you. It starts with us. But when we say, I've had enough. I don't want to starve to death anymore. I don't have to starve to death anymore. I'm going home to the Father. And when you say, I'm going home, and when you get up, it all ends with God running towards you. He's on His way right now. He's waiting. He's looking for you. He's on the porch. He won't go inside. He just wants you to get up and start heading towards Him. And He will meet you. He will run. He will belittle Himself to the lowest servant on earth to bring you back to His house. So, no matter, no matter what distant country you're in right now, no matter what distant country you're headed towards right now, God is sitting on the front porch. He's staring off into the distance and He wants you home. He wants you to come home today. And He can't get tired of waiting, but He'd love it if it was today. Every head bowed and all eyes closed. He's waiting. You've had your sudden awakening. You've been brutally honest. And Jesus is saying, come home to me right now. He's ready to run to you. All you have to do, if you don't know Him, if you've never asked Him to be your Lord, and you're just you, the Lord has just touched you right now. If you're on a if you're on a, a pathway that's that's headed to a distant country, or if you actually are in a distant country and no one even knows but you and your Lord, then you need to come up here for prayer. You need to come up here for prayer and be touched by the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody that needs prayer? Any single individual that needs prayer? And uh, brother. Um, Where's Brady? Brady, you want to play some music, brother? Glory to God. I'm going to turn this off. Nobody needs to hear. But if you have some prayer, we're going to spend some prayer time. Has anybody left? It's the last call. You might be having a... Not being brutally honest with yourself. You're going to leave unchanged. Nothing I can do about that. That's your fault. Amen. So many people quench the Spirit and they just drive home or walk. And it's like, well, this is a bad, bad day. Bad, bad day. Glory to God.